Hi, I'm Richard Nelson, Executive Director of the Commonwealth Policy Center. Welcome to our Legislative Forum. And joining me is Angela Minter, Executive Director and Founder of Sisters for Life. Angela, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me, Richard. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, full disclosure, uh, Angela has been a longtime friend and also mm -hmm. board member of the Commonwealth Policy Center. Mm -hmm. And That's I appreciate right. your service to oh. uh, the ministry and work of CPC. Absolutely, absolutely. I appreciate all the work you're doing. Well, thank so I'm you. just glad to be partnering. On this program, Angela, we're going to talk about the pro-life movement mm -hmm. and particularly with your work on the front lines mm -hmm. in Louisville. Mm -hmm. You have been involved for 17 years on mm -hmm. the front lines there, but I'd also like your perspective as we move on uh, to, about the pro-life movement in the country. But mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about Sisters for Life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, you know, when you said that 17 years, I was thinking, wow, has it been 17 years? 2004. Yeah. 2004. Yeah, it's been 17 years. But um, one of the things that Sisters for Life does is mm -hmm. we're called to really awaken, train, and mobilize uh, the church as a whole, but the historically black church in particular, to end abortion in our communities. And it was birthed out of my own personal experience with abortion. Mm -hmm. uh, my husband and I having two abortions when I mm -hmm. was 17 years old and mm -hmm. he was 18 years old. Or actually, I was 17 and then I was 18 mm -hmm. um, with the second one. Uh, he was 19 and uh, 20. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, as a result of that, the Lord really opened up our eyes and called us to this work. And um, that's really a long story short of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've heard the longer version. It's a mm -hmm. powerful story. Of course, you went through a uh, difficult period there, di difficult time in your life, but something mm -hmm. happened where a family member got a hold of you and learned that mm -hmm. you were pregnant out of wedlock Absolutely. and said, you're not going to abort my, my grandson or daughter. Mm -hmm. And um, that was powerful. But I mm -hmm. think that it's... it's, it's as kids, when we're young, when we're teenagers, we don't think through everything. Absolutely, we not. we do first, and we think later, and deal with the consequences later. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, unfortunate. With abortion, uh, it's it's an easy way out. People see abortion in general as a, if you're in a tough situation, if you're a teenager with an unplanned pregnancy, uh, people look at that as the solution mm -hmm. to the problem. And you know. Mm -hmm from your experience, that that's not necessarily the case. Yeah, not at all. And you're absolutely right. People look at it as a, as a quick fix. You know, I can, I can solve this, you know, this problem, if you will, by going ahead and having an abortion, which is why it's so important what you're doing, what we're doing at the Commonwealth Policy Center. Policies do matter. You know, when someone thinks it's, it's legal to do something, it's almost like it's, it's okay, you know. And, uh, and as a result of that, you wake up and you realize, wait a minute, what did I do? You know, yeah. what has happened? And it's so important for us to help young people, young people like me that was in that very same situation to understand that, no, uh, this isn't what you want to do. This is not the best choice. And just because yeah. it's legal, uh, it's not right. I want to just camp out for a moment mm -hmm. with your trauma that you went through as a teenager, those mm -hmm. abortions that you had. Uh, a lot of women are crippled by that mm -hmm. for the rest of their lives. They're psychologically, mm -hmm. emotionally, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes physically harmed. Mm -hmm. um, but that didn't happen to you. Uh, there are not many women who've gone through an abortion that are very, as open as you are about mm -hmm. it, but then further establish a ministry mm -hmm. like you have. Tell us what happened. How, right. how, did, how did you come to the place where you founded Sisters for Life and okay. got on the front lines of the restoring of the sanctity of life? Okay. Well, let me just go back. I mean, you were talking about some of the trauma that women experience, you know, mm -hmm. some physical, some emotional, psychological. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I actually experienced mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had psychological issues. I was extremely depressed. I just mm -hmm. didn't know the connection mm -hmm. uh, between abortion and, um, and depression, even, mm -hmm. even mental illness, you know. So yeah. I experienced that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the physical complications as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but because of the grace of God, you mm -hmm. know, it really was the grace of God because the Lord called me to this work. He called mm -hmm. me to do Sisters for Life. It was birthed out of my own personal experience. Yeah. And so for me as a Christian, anything God calls you to do, he's going to anoint you to do it. It's not easy to, to talk to people about paying money for two of your babies to be mm. killed through abortion mm. as a teenager. Uh, mm -hmm. And when you do that, you're basically reliving that. You're revisiting yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, but fortunately, I know that my babies are, are in heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a scripture that I absolutely love. And, and, yeah. and David says, you know, my child will not come back to me, but I will go to him. Mm. And so one day I'll see our children again, my husband mm -hmm. and I both. And we've named those children. Yeah. Uh, but 
in that, God said, you know what, I'm going to help you uh, to help someone else not experience what you've experienced and to know that there is hope and that there is a ministry that can be birthed out of that that misery that you experienced. You know what I think of another scriptural passage is when Joseph was with his brothers Mm -hmm. and Oh, and yeah. and Joseph, of course, we know the story. The brothers threw Joseph in a pit. They mm-hmm. wanted to kill him. Then one mm-hmm. of the brothers said, no, don't do that. We'll sell him into slavery. Mm-hmm. And that was a pretty evil thing mm-hmm. to sell your sibling, your, your brother, into slavery. Mm-hmm. And when they finally met some several years later, mm-hmm. Joseph said, what you meant for evil, mm-hmm. God meant for good. That's absolutely right. And, and I'm not going to say that abortion is something that... Um, is a good ever, but Mm -hmm. what was meant to harm you and to derail you and to Mm -hmm. just put you off of the scene altogether, God used that Mm -hmm. in a way. Your story is you you weren't, you you didn't stay in that place of emotional and psychological incapacitation. You Mm -hmm. allowed God to heal you. Mm -hmm. His grace was extended to you. Absolutely. And a a ministry was birthed. Mm -hmm. And you're able to help women who are considering abortion. Mm -hmm. And um, you've actually saved a lot of unborn lives. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got to see you in action. I've been there in front of EMW Women's Clinic. Mm -hmm. I don't like to call it a clinic because it's an abortion center. Clinics are meant to help and to um, serve and that does the opposite. Mm -hmm. But um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing there and then also how many babies have been saved. Okay. Well, you know, Sisters for Life is just, it takes a whole, we take a holistic approach to Mm -hmm. this issue. One of the things Mm -hmm. you talked about is being able to come out of all of that. And one of the things that we do is called uh, support after abortion. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're not encouraging women to go and have an abortion, but it is important. It's Mm -hmm. it's extremely, it's vitally important that women know that even if you make that choice, there is hope, there is healing. Uh, there's forgiveness mm-hmm. and there mm-hmm. is a support system that you can reach out to to find that help that you need and help mm-hmm. you to walk walk out that path so that you don't end up in a situation like I did where you have uh, suicide attempts. You try mm-hmm. to take your life and you just think that life is hopeless. I can't be forgiven. Yeah. So that's part of what we do. Mm-hmm. The other part of that is the uh, sidewalk counseling. Yeah. And you mentioned the EMW, the so-called yeah. surgical center, which is yeah. absolutely anything but, yeah. you know, it's anything yeah. but a, a center, a medical facility. It, I I refer to it really as a killing meal. They're averaging some 3,000 babies Mm -hmm. and and babies that they're killing through abortion uh, every year. It's over Mm -hmm. 3,000 now. Mm -hmm. Uh, With that 3,000 babies, there are women that are, are, are... are destroyed, you know, in that moment, in that time, um, through the, the experience. And so we do sidewalk counseling there to make sure, some people call it protesting, but Sisters for Life is not protesting. What we are doing is we're saying we're here to help counsel you. Yeah. Regardless of what you choose today, you need to know that there's help available. I don't want women to experience what I experienced and have to wait 20-something years to realize I could be forgiven and set free yeah. and something can something good, like you used that scripture, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, referred to that with Joseph. Mm-hmm. He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to save yeah. many people alive. And that's one yeah. of the, the scriptures that the Holy Spirit really gave me yeah. uh, when I experienced that, that now I'm going to use this that was mm-hmm. evil to save many people alive. And some 900 babies wow. have been saved just through our sidewalk counseling alone through mm-hmm. Sisters for Life. And, you know, when we go to that sidewalk, we're again, we're there to let women know there is another choice. Yeah. You know, you do yeah. have another choice that you can make. Number one. And when you make that choice and when you change your mind and you decide, you know, I'm going to keep my baby. I'm going to give my baby an opportunity to live. It is imperative that they know what are the resources that are available. We're able to connect them with pregnancy centers, pregnancy homes. Uh, We're able to connect them with our organization where we do mentoring and we walk alongside them through life. So that's just a a snippet of what God has used us to do. That's great. So there are 900 lives that you can point to that yes. have been saved from being aborted, Absolutely. discarded, just considered a product of conception. Mm-hmm. These are real lives, yes. real human beings That's that right. are now alive. That's right. And, and women, you know, and, and women, women who, as who well. avoided that. That's as absolutely well. right. Absolutely. Uh, I think, Angela, one of the, the things that really isn't talked about a lot is the trauma of abortion. Like mm-hmm. we said, the emotional, psychological, sometimes the physical, mm-hmm. but it really is a traumatic experience for women mm-hmm. when, uh, and it's, by the way, um, when a woman is in a cri- uh, unplanned pregnancy, mm-hmm. sometimes maybe a crisis pregnancy, even, uh, I don't want to minimize the hurt or the pain, Mm -hmm. the turmoil. I mean, Mm -hmm. she might have parents that are telling her, a teenage girl might have parents saying, get the abortion. Mm -hmm. Or she might have a boyfriend pressuring her to get the abortion. I'll leave you if you don't get the abortion. Mm -hmm. So she's in a very difficult position in many cases. And yet abortion doesn't solve the problem. It Mm -hmm. is 
it is something that really will compound the problem. Mm-hmm. And you're able to, to share that with them in a mm-hmm. loving way. Yes. You're, I've seen you at work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're persistent. Uh, this is work, by the way, that most people aren't called to. Mm-hmm. You've got to have thick skin. Mm-hmm. You have to have a calling to do it. Right. I but so. I've seen you do it. And, and I just, uh, 900 lives. Mm-hmm. That's, that's amazing. And yeah. you're not just saving the baby's life, but you're helping mm-hmm. the mother as Absolutely. well. Yeah, you know, the mother with and the father and mm-hmm. those families. You know, when we are on that sidewalk and we're uh, there doing the sidewalk counseling, we're, we're seeing, we have an opportunity to talk to the fathers, you yeah. know. Yeah. And there's yeah. so many different, you know, circumstances that are surrounding that pregnancy. Yeah. But when that father, you know, here's the truth, you know, and, and here's the fact that God loves you. He loves that baby. Yeah. Uh, the mother, when she hears that God loves you, he loves you enough to have me come here and share my, my dirty laundry, if you yeah. will, you know, yeah. and, uh, and the experience that I've had and the rest of our team to be able to lovingly share the truth and give them hope. And then with their families, because there are many different mothers and fathers bringing their children there. And like you said, many of them are feeling pressured. They're the statistically over 50 percent, um, look probably a lot higher than that, yeah. or, or say that they're pressured to mm-hmm. have an abortion. So when you're there to be able to help them to know that there are other options and there's so many different resources that are available. It yeah. makes all the difference. But if they go through with the abortion, they need to know, like me, you know, that you can begin again, that you can make better choices, you know, that you can really uh, get your mind renewed and understand your value, you know, and, and the value of your baby and uh, understand that you can make some different choices. Yeah, and that's good. So, so what I'm hearing from you is truth and grace, truth mm-hmm. that this is an unborn life. I mm-hmm. want you to choose life for that, un- mm-hmm. that unborn child, mm-hmm. but also the grace if a woman does choose to terminate that pregnancy, the life of that child, which is something that she'll have to live with. But mm-hmm. you're there to help her. Mm-hmm. You're there to walk with her mm-hmm. and counsel her. Uh, how, you know, you've saved a lot of babies, 900 mm-hmm. some babies. How many have you been able to see after they've been born? Hmm. Uh, I, I mean, I know you've seen some. Right. I've seen pictures of, mm-hmm. of, of you with them. But uh, just kind of I, tell us about that feeling, I guess. Let me go to that. Mm-hmm. How does it feel to hold the baby who might have been aborted mm. and a child that you know you just changed the mother's destiny you changed that child's destiny oh it, it, it's i don't know that there are any words you know in the human vernacular to really describe that yeah. all you can do is just really thank the lord for allowing yeah. you to be a part of that yeah. uh, one in particular is a, a young boy that is now i guess uh, maybe 10 12 years wow. old okay because uh, we've been doing sight while counseling for some time now. I'm doing yeah. ministry, as you said, yeah. for a while now. Yeah. Uh, but that yeah. happened to actually be uh, a cousin of mine oh, who had no idea that the Lord had called me to this work. Mm-hmm. And she was coming mm-hmm. to an abortion, the abortion mill, the EMW. And she happened to see me in the distance, and I saw her in the distance. And I let her know, oh, no, you are not uh, going to go in there and have that abortion, you know. And uh, those escorts that are escorting the women in and supposedly protecting them from those who want to offer these women loving help. Uh, Many people call them death escorts because they're escorting the women into death. Uh, They resisted and everything. But you know what? I said, listen, uh, you're not going to go in there until you and I sit down and talk. And uh, we're going to talk. I said, we're going to we're going to talk. And I'm going to I'm going to call uncle uncle on you. (laughs) And as a result of calling uncle, you know, I'm threatening to call uncle. She was willing to go with me. And fortunately, there was a pregnancy resource center right across from there. We went in there, sat down and counseled. And we have a saved baby. Happens to be my little cousin. That was a personal story for you. That was your nephew that was saved. Cousin. Uh, Cousin, I'm uh-huh. cousin, but second it was cousin. a okay. But the yeah. child mm-hmm. was your second. Uh, it was my cousin's. It's my cousin's baby. Gotcha. So it was my little cousin. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're going to take a quick break. Okay. We are uh, at a hard break here. Thanks okay. for joining CPC's Legislative Forum. We'll be back in just a moment. Jason, let's go see your room. What do you think? We kept it a little spare, so you can decorate it how you like. Dinner! Hello? Excellent. Soccer is fun. Yeah, I saw you guys out there. We're in the family. We're in the family. Come on, come on. Yeah! Oh, I thought you were on my team. Wait, I don't know. Okay, you're just...
Welcome back to Commonwealth Policy Center's Legislative Forum. And joining me again is uh, Angela Minter, founder and executive director of Sisters for Life. Welcome back, Angela. Oh, I'm excited to be here. Hey, and I'm excited to hear your story of uh, interceding for the unborn, mm -hmm. um, saving lives. 900 mm -hmm. lives have been saved mm -hmm. through your ministry, through yeah. the sidewalk counseling, mm -hmm. and then also the women who have been ministered to as well. You don't mm -hmm. just say, hey, don't have an abortion and then go back home. Mm -hmm. You're there to walk through the difficult time with them, mm -hmm. minister, connecting them to a pregnancy care center, or maybe getting them to a maternity home, mm -hmm. helping them get what they need at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Angela, this is something that um, uh, it's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I wish more people were involved in it, mm -hmm. but you're, you're making a difference, oh, yeah. real difference that affect mm -hmm. real people. And I'm so encouraged by, uh, by what you're doing. I want us to talk about how we got to this place of mm -hmm. abortion on demand. Right. At the U.S. Supreme Court legalized abortion on demand in all mm -hmm. 50 states in 1973. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it really the abortion movement started way before that, mm -hmm. uh, Planned Parenthood. Uh, founder Margaret Sanger mm -hmm. promoted abortion. Mm -hmm. um, she was very uh, anti-child. Mm -hmm. uh, she was also racist mm -hmm. as well she, mm -hmm. in her writings and mm -hmm. in her interviews. Uh, right. She was very racist. Um, mm -hmm. And I've heard you and Sisters for Life speak on this. Tell mm -hmm. us more about the connection between Planned Parenthood and the racist policies targeting minority po populations. Okay, absolutely. <clears throat> well, you know, again, it didn't start, you know, in 1973. Long before mm -hmm. that, I think around 1939, mm -hmm. uh, Margaret Sanger came out with the Negro Project, mm -hmm. where she targeted uh, leaders in the black community and convinced them that they that the black race really mm -hmm. didn't need to have uh, children, many mm -hmm. children. She said blacks were considered as human weeds, mm -hmm. and that's not something that she sold them on, I mean, told mm -hmm. to them, to their mm -hmm. face. But as you said, in her writing. So she was a racist, a eugenicist, and she targeted the black community. And uh, it's still mm -hmm. happening today where, you know, they're, they're in the black community, Planned Parenthood has planted over 70% of their abortion facilities mm -hmm. right in minority and inner city neighborhoods. And again, uh, many people are just unaware you know of the of the history, but some some are aware, but still think that Planned Parenthood is their friend. And so, one of the things, as I said in the very beginning, the first segment, is that Sisters for Life is called to awaken, train, and mobilize the church as a whole, but again, the historically black church in particular, to see abortion ended and so that the community is not continuing to believe that Planned Parenthood is, is a facility that, that has our best, in, best interest at heart, because they don't. Now, we saw an expansion of Planned Parenthood in Louisville mm -hmm. uh, under the Bevin administration. They put that um, permit, mm -hmm. the license, on hold because mm -hmm. they were in violation of the law. Right. There was a lawsuit over that. Mm -hmm. uh, but w under the Bashir administration, who's been in office for a little over a year, mm -hmm. uh, he allowed that um, permit process to go through. So Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. is up and running in, a mm -hmm. in Louisville. Right, what, what are they doing there? Tell, tell us more about the Planned Parenthood that's on the ground in Louisville. Yeah, right where, they're, where they're, like you said, they're mm -hmm. aborting babies. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Planned Parenthood has, has expanded. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they're Planned Parenthood of Indiana and Kentucky, mm -hmm. okay? And mm -hmm. then most recently, another uh, large Planned Parenthood organization has come on board with them. So they're a billion-dollar organization. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just in our state, they come together and partner. Mm -hmm. Why it's so important for us, you know, those who believe in the sanctity of life, to partner together, to come together to make sure we get this work done. But they're killing babies there, you know, through the week mm -hmm. and on the weekend. And, uh, you know, they fought against having a uh, hospital admissions uh, 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 license and uh, admitting privileges and, and uh, ambulatory uh, mm -hmm. care. They fought against all of that. But those things were put in place. And Governor Bevin, former Governor Bevin, uh, was able to stop and halt them from getting a license because they killed, I think, some 20 babies or so right. prior to legally operating. That's and right. so these things were put in place to make sure that we protect the mother and mm -hmm. the father and to save these babies and to save these families. And so Planned Parenthood it, it is a big business and they're a yeah. billion dollar organization and they mean nothing but but uh, they mean nothing but evil. And you know when we've had all this uh, racial turmoil going on in our country mm -hmm. Planned Parenthood finally came out and said you know what we have had racial, we've had racist practices. Yeah. They 
acknowledged that their founder, mm -hmm. Margaret Sanger, was a racist and a eugenicist, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. They acknowledged some of the things that they've been doing, you know, to target blacks. Yeah. And so that acknowledgement just further lets the community know, you know, the black community in particular, know that, hey, this is not an organization that we need to embrace. Yeah. This is an organization that we need to make sure that we expose uh, for their practices, you know, exactly. one of which is selling babies' body parts, planted organ I mean, literally targeting minorities as if to say, you know, we're a healthcare facility and we're here to take care of the poor yeah. and the needy to basically be your savior. Bless, yeah. uh, the black community does not need that yeah. uh, in our communities. That's right. That's good. And I appreciate you making that connection between the racist roots of Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. and then the location of Planned Parenthood facilities. Seventy percent mm -hmm. are in mm -hmm. minority neighborhoods across yeah. the country. That's right. Uh, Planned Parenthood receives a lot of tax dollars. Mm -hmm. At one point, they were getting up to $500 million a year mm -hmm. by the federal government. Right. In Kentucky, that's no longer the case. Mm -hmm. exactly. uh, that was cut out under the Bevin administration. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, I want to go back to something you said about this, uh, the transfer agreement policy. There's an mm -hmm. ambulatory service agreement policy mm -hmm. that any abortion center in Kentucky had to have an agreement with a local hospital mm -hmm. uh, to take in the patients if something would happen during that right. procedure. Absolutely. And um, the, the abortion industry fought it in court, and I, I'm not sure where that is. I, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with where that is in the legal proceedings, but mm -hmm. I, that was a long, ongoing case. Yeah, absolutely a long, ongoing case. Uh, but still, our new governor, you know, unfortunately granted them the ability to, to go ahead yeah. and um, start practicing yeah. and, and doing those abortions. Yeah, uh, so <clears throat> I wish I knew more before I brought that up. But there was a bill passed this last session mm -hmm. uh, that would authorize Kentucky's Attorney General, yes. Daniel Cameron, mm -hmm. who is pro-life. Right. It authorizes him to enforce Kentucky's uh, abortion laws. Mm -hmm. So perhaps he's the person that would take that up. But we need to talk to him. We need to have him on the program, I guess, to talk about it. Um, the right to life issue is something that we talk about a lot mm -hmm. uh, here at CPC, and that's because it's a pillar issue. Right. We believe that the sanctity of human life is the most fundamental right, mm -hmm. and the first object of all good government is to preserve uh, human life, to that's protect absolutely. human life. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will talk about this, a saying from, uh, that farmers use, we will talk about it till the cows come home. Mm -hmm, absolutely. <laughs> That's an old farming term, when the mm -hmm. dairy cows are ready to come back into the barn for milking or to get hay. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is something that we will continue to talk about because it's so important. Mm -hmm. And Angela, I think sometimes you and I and others uh, take it for granted because mm -hmm. we're, we were born, we came into the world, but mm -hmm. there are a lot of people today, uh, it's not a given that if... Um, that you make it into the world. Mm -hmm. One out of three, I believe one out of three or one out of four, somewhere in there, pregnancies mm -hmm. will end in abortion mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. And that's a tragedy. Yes, it is. Um, what can people do? So you're on the front lines mm -hmm. with Sisters for Life, Commonwealth Policy Center is working for policies in Frankfurt. Um, what can the average person do that would, that would like to restore the sanctity of life ethic? What are some practical things that they can do? Uh, practical things, just from a Christian standpoint, pray. You know, uh, mm -hmm. if you're if you're a Christian, you mm -hmm. know, then pray um, and pray that God would give us leaders that believe in the sanctity yeah. of human life. Uh, yeah. If you're not if you're not a Christian, but you believe that every life has value, yeah. you know, then there are things that you can do. Uh, interestingly enough, we're talking about Commonwealth policy and policies do matter. Something you can do in the voting booth. Yes. Make sure that you yeah. put people in office that have the values that you have. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, you know, go out and vote. And then even in, even after you vote it, make yeah. sure that you contact your legislatures, yeah. you know, and let them know, hey, I understand that this is going on. Yeah. You're doing these, well, these forums and legislative updates and letting people yeah. in the community know uh, bills that are coming up and, and educating us. It's yeah. important. Uh, yeah. You know, we perish for lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So when people get that information, they have an opportunity to be a voice, a voice for the voiceless, we like to say. You can be that voice and make sure that you let your legislators know, I sent you to Frankfurt for a reason. I believe in the sanctity of life, and I believe in the sanctity of the family. Yeah. So, but it begins with prayer. Mm -hmm. If Absolutely. you're pro-life, if you're a follower of Jesus, we should mm -hmm. pray for good things. We should mm -hmm. pray that life would be protected. Yeah. Pray uh, for our leaders. Pray, you know, that, pray for our leaders. You know, let me just interject this. Yeah. You know, a lot of times what I've seen is people, mm -hmm. you know, that believe in the power of prayer. Um, they only pray for the leaders that they care about the leaders yeah. that they're in favor of. And, and that is just not 
uh, that's just not right. Yeah. We need to make sure that we pray for all of our leaders. Right. And that's I believe a, that if we do that, uh, yeah. we're going to see some better changes. That's a really good point. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up because when that admonition was given in the New Testament, in mm -hmm. the book of Romans, Paul was in jail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Paul mm -hmm. said, pray for your leaders. Mm -hmm. And you know what? He was jailed by those leaders. That's right. And he said that's to right. still pray for them. Absolutely. And it's powerful when you begin to pray for those that you don't agree with or mm -hmm. those that you oppose. Yes. But then after we're done praying and pouring our heart out to God, mm -hmm. then we take action. We yeah, don't just pray and say, Lord, I did my part, right? Mm -hmm, then mm -hmm. we take, we look for other opportunities yes. for how can we make a difference so that this prayer can be fulfilled. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Uh, so you'd mentioned voting. Mm -hmm. I want to ask this, Angela, mm -hmm. how important when you prioritize issues mm -hmm. and when you look at the candidates that are on the ballot, usually there's two of them, mm -hmm. where would you rank this, the life issue, the abortion issue, as far as looking at the candidates and who you should vote for? Well, you know, in my opinion, there is no other weightier issue than the than the life issue because without life you cannot take advantage of mm. housing education you know any of these other yeah. things health care any of these other things and so um, the you know Declaration of Independence and you know we've been given these inalienable rights of life liberty and the pursuit of happiness what you don't have life you can't experience liberty and pursuit of happiness and believe me there is no liberty there is no liberty when you take when you're thinking that there's a policy out there that allows me to take a human life and this is okay there's no liberty in that there's no freedom in that and just like with with yeah. slavery you know people pass bad policy. Yeah. They legalized slavery, you know, the Supreme Court legalizing slavery, yeah. you know, and saying yeah. that blacks were not human beings. They're not yeah. real, real human beings. Yeah. And, but at the same time, that was bad policy. You know? yeah. The Dred Scott decision, that mm -hmm. was a Supreme Court That's decision right. that said that blacks are just property, that mm -hmm. they're not human. So it, it's a, it was an appalling decision, mm -hmm. but it's also a lesson to all of us that the Supreme mm -hmm. Court can get it wrong, mm -hmm. right? That's right. And just as they did with the Roe v. Wade decision, Absolutely. they got it wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, so as people of life, we want to work to restore a culture of life. We want yes. us to embrace the sanctity of life ethic where we value that unborn child. We value the mom in the crisis pregnancy. Mm -hmm. We walk through difficult situations with people who need our help. Mm -hmm. uh, but it takes time. It takes investment. Mm -hmm. uh, voting for pro-life leaders. Mm -hmm. So once they get into office, then they can enact pro-life policies. Mm -hmm. and, and that means that we can engage. We can make phone calls and do these other things. Mm -hmm. Angela, we are out of time. Oh, I no. wish we could go on, but this has I been a know. really good program. It's been awesome. Hey. It's been awesome. Can I say this before we wrap up? There's another thing that we can really do that's going to help mm -hmm. with these issues, mm -hmm. and that is become empathic listeners. It is so yes. important for us to start yeah. listening to yes. one another, regardless yeah. of the side of the aisle, if you will, that you may be on, whether you're a Democrat or Republican or Christian or non-Christian or whatever, but to be empathic listeners. That's I think that's something huge that we can do. Good word. Angela Minter, God bless you. Thank God you. Bless you. Good word.